Okay, so this week we're going over the third season of The Guild, and here we have the intro to that, as well as the comic book. Um, now, this comic book is actually a prequel to the series, and I'm assigning it this week because it was actually published at the same time that the third season of The Guild came out. So, you know, obviously The Guild that we've been watching so far is a form of digital online media. Um, and you're watching over the course of this time period, a set of directors, writers, and producers put together online media. Um, and typically they've been doing so from outside of the big budget corporate Hollywood system. And so just like with the Guild, and we've read about this, they start with a very low budget. And then they start ramping up from there. And so this is the season where you can just watch the amount of impact that a few years of success and well business management garnering together, you know, um, people who will supplement the, the film's bottom line um, and how much that will impact and improve the quality of the product that they're able to produce. So the third season is the season where you really start to see this come together. Um, and so part of what you see is that they branch out into other mediums. So we have the comic book, The Guild. Um, another thing that you're going to notice is Will Wheaton. Uh, Will, Will Wheaton, his name should be familiar to a lot of you. And they cast him as the guild leader of the Axis of Evil, which are the nemesis of our guild. Um, and he gets integrated into the storyline with, hmm, something like that. Oops, didn't mean to do that. A little bit of a technical glitch there, but I fixed it. Um, he's the guild leader of the Axis of Evil, and they come into conflict with our guild as they're waiting for the release of an expansion of their game so that they can start playing on a whole brand new level. So um, what the prequel shows us is, in contrast to the avatars that we see here in the beginning of the guild, which we're familiar with, is that in the beginning, um, Felicia Day's character who is Sid in the series, um, also Codex in the game. When she starts the game off as a complete newbie, she has almost none of, of the, the costume that we're accustomed to seeing in the guild. So you can see her here when she initially picks her name as Codex, um, and then her avatar that she's in a simple white shift and uh, she doesn't have the shoes, the armor, the neck necklace, the healer scepter. She doesn't have any of that. She has a stick that she's carrying. Um, and we see that by the end of the, the prequel, she has won a pair of shoes. And it, they explains, and for killing stuff, you get rewards like clothing. Whose idea was that? Genius. So you can see how um, the mise-en-scene, and especially the costuming of the avatars in the guild are supposed to articulate to us symbolically the success of the characters within their virtual gaming world. So here in the third season, um, we're going to start off with the comic book for several reasons. Um, first of all, it is the prequel. Also, the artwork in the Guild comic book is just fantastic. Um, most of the art was done by Jim Rigg. You can see his name here on the cover. Um, and it's really just engrossing to me the level of detail that he was able to to cram into this comic book. So it's a backstory for the web series. And here you can see two side-by-side -side images done by Jim Rigg. Um, here is her in her fantasy world um, gaming. She's in her real world here dressed as we normally see her in front of her laptop with the webcam. Um, and then you see this sort of blurry division between her reality and her fantasy world, her gaming world, where there's castles and statues and she is, um, you know, this sort of mythological science fiction avatar. Um, and then also we have her here in her avatar, but it's a little bit more down to earth here. She still has her scepter and her corset and you see the corset in both, um, most of her costume. 
um, but these shoes seem to be a little bit more normal. And But importantly, she's carrying her violin, and she's standing up in front of and over her boyfriend, who is kneeling in front of her while he plays his guitar. So we can see here that these, even though these images are done by the same artist, they're depicting different sides of the character that we're going to see developed in the guild. The artwork here seems to um, illustrate a exceptional version of Sid in which she wishes to embody, where she is the powerful one, where she is um, bustier than she is in real life, more curvaceous, more feminine, um, more powerful, and more, um, I, I guess you would just put it more sexy, more explicitly sexy than she is in her real life. Also, her violin shows her artistic ability, and we're going to see that conflict between um, her and her boyfriend develop throughout the comic um, platform. Um, and also, I wanted, I do want to draw oops, your attention to the fact that she has red hair. Red hair has become sort of a trope in the 21st century of characters who are sassy and powerful. I'm just having problems with things popping up on my computer here. Sorry about that. But I'm getting ready to go to San Francisco, so we're just going to keep going and make do. So here we see in the Transmedia series, um, we read in the book about how a Transmedia series has to unfold over three or more platforms. And the Guild has definitely more than three platforms, but the three that we're going to talk about today, um, just to bring this to your attention and to remind you of a couple of things, is that here we've got the print platform where even though it's not digital online, this is considered another platform that can be used in a transmedia series. This is analog, of course, this print version. Then we have the digital online web series. And then last but not least, there is a live component to um, the guild. And this is something that I think is undervalued a lot of times or overlooked, I should say, not undervalued, overlooked when you're thinking about multiple platforms in which a narrative can unfold. But the whole convention round has become so ultra popular here in the 21st century as a way to meet and interact with digital um, online fans and, and a way, frankly, for these um sort of grassroots ventures to get and drum up money and, um, and and sort of stoke the fire of fandom and to, to do sort of grassroots fundraising through their fans. So these live con components where um, the stars show up at Comic-Cons or various other gaming conferences or online or digital media conferences where they have fan interaction, those actually still count. And you'll notice that, of course, all the characters are here in their avatar costumes. They're not in street clothes. Um, the, the, the fans want to see them show up and, and be dressed like, like their fantasies. So to get back to the comic book, um, I want to draw your attention to, especially because this week we're talking about cinematography, is how comic books employ frames just the same way that filmmakers do. Um, of course, with a film, the frames are... With the filmmaker, the parameters of the frame, the edges of the frame, are established by the camera itself. And whatever he or she points um, the camera at, the edges that go outside of that range establish the edge of the frame. But in a comic book, the frames are established by the artist. And they follow a lot of the same sort of conventions that filmmakers do. And we're going to be talking about that. So this is a visual medium, just the same way that the web series is. Um, videos, of course, average 28 frames per second. And those frames are passing by your eyes at, at this rate in order to make the emotion appear nonstop. The way that um, film does that, makes movement possible, um, it tricks our minds into thinking that what we're seeing in front of us is realistic and represents a real world, even though it's very constructed. And we're going to be really emphasizing that when we move on to editing. Whereas in comic books, um, there are only about six to eight frames per page. Sometimes only four. Sometimes there's only even one frame per page. And so you need to think about the way in which 
these frames visually participate in telling the story. So each frame visually communicates a lot of information to us. First of all, we've got just, if you look here at this frame of the band members, um, you can tell that they're band members. They're dressed like band members. We have one in a suit, very much sort of the cliche, the 21st century band. And then the rest of the members look like you know, sort of old fashioned band members with the black concert t-shirts. They're very punk, um, ripped off sleeves. We've got shaggy hair. We've got this guy in the trucker's cap. Um, they're all drinking beer. We have one, two, three, four beers for our four people. And then one small bottle. I'm not sure what that is. It looks like we also have a couple of water glasses. Um, and then we have the milkshake in front of Sid. And I think I'm supposed to draw our attention to the fact that even though she does have a beer bottle here, it's pushed behind the milkshake. The milkshake is what is closest to her. And so even though she's sitting here at the booth in this, this area with these people, just like she does in the guild, um, when they go out to eat with, with the, her other guild members, um, she's part of this group, but she's also separate from them. She's the one drinking the milkshake while they're all drinking their multiple beers. Um, so Sid is also in her usual conservative attire here. And so this does show that she's not trying to play and pretend like she's someone that she's not. And the next frame here, we have her at home on her couch reading a book, Codex. And that gives us some sort of information about where she got her avatar's name from. Um, and then we have here where she, and in here we have her gaming with the post-it notes that we, she's already told she's obsessed with. And here she, we have her sleeping, but it's in the middle of the day. And you can tell that because um, there's sunlight coming through the window behind her and the clock says three o'clock. That has to be three o'clock in the afternoon, not three o'clock in the morning. So we get this idea that Sid probably is a bit depressed um, because she's sleeping in the middle of the day or at least unemployed. She doesn't seem to be going to work. She plays games, she reads books, she takes naps. And then at nighttime, she starts gaming again. Now, these frames here are supposed to convey information. This is almost like a montage where we see the passing of time. This is what a typical Sid day is like. Um, and then here, this is supposed to be um, maybe a smaller amount of time compared to a whole day, but the larger frame makes us think that she probably spent a lot of time here hanging out with the dinner. And there's a lot more information to be conveyed here that she's a part of a community. Um, again, here we've got these sort of very small frames that are supposed to, and they're dark, um, supposed to show the passing of time. Again, this is a typical evening. She's alone. She's with her computer. She's with her book. Um, she's looking into a lighter space in the middle, but she's not part of it. This is the band practice. But then down here, this is a very nice contrast. It's a large frame, again, shows its significance, and it's di diagonal to this one, um, shows its significance in that this is her place of escape and freedom where she wants to spend more time. Again, here we've got these three small frames. They're supposed to communicate a smaller amount of time. And then this sort of wheel frame where this seems to be her sort of her memories, what she's remembering is what is enveloping her at all times. Um, and it all relates down to this kiss here in the bottom. And so we do read these frames as a visual language. We've got these close-ups of, um, or medium close-ups of Sid here, and then a close-up of Sid and her boyfriend kissing. Um, and then we've got these real close-ups of the pill bottles, which or communicating information is this is making sure that we understand that she didn't just go to the pharmacy to pick up something in particular. She is picking up Xanflow, which we can only assume is, um, you know, a way of avoiding saying Xan X. So she's got anxiety or something. 
And then we see that she uh, this makes she's afraid that these pills are going to make her sick. She's got a memory of this, um, where apparently gave her diarrhea <laughs> and the vomits. So I'm going to pause here.